Good morning. This is our prayer for the beginning of worship today. Almighty, eternal, and merciful God, whose word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, open and illuminate our minds that we may purely and perfectly understand thy word, and that our lives may be conformed to what we have rightly understood, that in nothing we may be displeasing unto thy majesty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome to worship this morning. Once again, I hope and pray that you're all doing well. And I look forward very soon to being together again. More details on that later. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. All the people of the land, from the east to the west and from the north to the south. We shall praise God's holy name. Grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, number 399, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Thank you. 
dear God, we come to worship you today. We come to sing, pray, and listen. You always hear us. Help us to hear you. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Once again, I hope this video finds you well. And as you probably know by now, I'm excited to announce that uh, next Sunday, the 21st, we will be back together outside for outdoor worship. You will or should have received uh, an email or letter about that by now. And if not, you will very shortly with all the details about how that's going to work. For today, our lesson is about two of my favorite parables. They're actually part of a, a group of three parables, but there are two that really stand out to me. Parables were stories that Jesus told to grab people's imagination, but to get them to think about really important points that they might not otherwise understand or, or talk about. The first is a parable of the lost sheep. You probably know this story. There was a shepherd. He had a hundred sheep and one was lost. Now you might say, well, 99 still pretty good. It's still a pretty good profit at the market. But the shepherd put all the 99 back in their pens and went out looking for the one sheep that was lost. The 99 were super important to the shepherd. But in that moment, that one sheep needed him the most. And so while he loved all his sheep the same, there was one sheep that needed his intervention, needed his help in that moment. And it's connected to the other parable in that sequence, the one that we all know really well. The parable of the prodigal son. And you know the story there was a young guy who really, in his culture, said that, I wish you were dead, Dad. I want my half of the inheritance now. And he, his dad paid it to him. And he went out and he spent it at all the restaurants and casinos and all the places he probably shouldn't have been spending it on. And he had a lot of big parties, made a lot of friends until it was gone. And he was left in the pigsty, eating the slop that the pigs eat. And he thought to himself, at least let me go home. Let me go home because at least maybe my dad will let me work as a servant of a nice bed, of a belly full of something other than pig slop. And he went home. And I love the part of the story that tells us that while he was still some ways away, his father saw him and ran to him which I always interpret as his dad was out looking for him or anticipating his return. And you know how the story goes. He threw a big party, huge party, gave him a fine robe. And out back was the older son who was moping around, who thought that he did everything the right way. Why should the youngest son get any kind of special privilege. And I could just imagine the father saying to his son, I love you both the same, but this son was lost and now he's found. He's dead and now he's alive. And so the important reminder of these parables is that while we are all loved by God, sometimes some of us get lost, need extra help, need to be found, need to be lifted up. God loves us all equally, but sometimes, even as his children, we have to go out and help those who are in need. We're loved equally, but sometimes our need for God's intervention and presence is a little bit greater. So I hope you think about those two parables. They're deep, they're wonderful, and they remind us of the wonderful love of our God. May we have that same kind of wonderful love for one another. Have a great week, and I'll see you soon. Take care. People of God, when we search our souls, 
we quickly discover we have not loved God with all that we have and all that we are. And we don't love our neighbors the way that we ought to love ourselves. And so let us confess this reality to the God who forgives, heals, and redeems. Please join me in the prayer of confession as printed in your bulletin. Compassionate Christ, you have shown your love in works of healing, forgiveness, and justice, and by giving yourself to us and for us in your death and resurrection. Yet we are slow to love and to serve. We seek to have our own needs met before caring for the needs of others. We fail to give ourselves and choose instead to preserve our safety and our comfort. Forgive us, heal us, and teach us to live lives of compassion following your example. Thank you, Jesus, that in your extravagant compassion you have already secured our forgiveness. Help us to receive this grace and share it. We are so grateful. May we go and live differently because of what you, Jesus, have done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. How then shall we live in response to this good news? By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for each other. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us love not in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I will be reading 1 John 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. 
Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him, and he is in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to God's word, let's ask for his help and understanding. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, through whom we live and move and have our being, in these strange and uncertain days, remind us of who we are as your church. Remind us of the mission you have called us to and remind us that you have given us everything we need to live it out. In your name we pray. Amen. I've been thinking a lot about love lately with my Ashley and my 10-year anniversary a couple weeks ago, I officiated a socially distanced wedding last week. That was a, a fun and different experience. I'll be going to, I'll be attending a socially distanced wedding. My sister-in-law is getting married next week, Ashley to see. And so love in that regard has been in the air. And love's been on my mind for other reasons, too, as I watch what's going on in our country and think about how we, the church, are to respond, not just to current events, but to the world. How are we supposed to live as God's ambassadors? We're supposed to be people of love. What does that mean? John, in our chapter today, encourages us to, to love one another. In fact, John kind of brings down the hammer as he says, if you don't love others, then you don't love God. And if you don't love God, you don't know God. That's kind of terrifying stuff. But we are to love one another. So I began thinking a lot about love and what it means to love our neighbor. Because remember how Jesus summarized all of the 600 plus laws in the Old Testament. Love God with everything you have, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And as we see in this passage from John, 1 John 4, one of my favorites. I'll give you a moment for laughter. 
we see that these two things are not two commandments as much as they are different sides of the same coin. If I don't love my neighbor, I can't love God. And if I'm not loving God, I can't love my neighbor. And so our, the two passages I picked today are a reflection of how we do both of these things. And I want to start with the Micah chapter. If you go into my office here at the church, my study, i got to get out of the habit of calling it an office. It's a study. They're very different things. However, if you go into my study, currently on the floor because I have to repair it and rehang it up, but there's a gift I got from my in-laws when I was ordained. Not ordained, when I was installed here. And it's my favorite verse. Actually, my favorite verse. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. I want to quickly unpack what each of those things means. When we think about justice here in the West, we tend to think about one kind of justice. Retributive justice. When somebody does something wrong, They serve time to pay for it. Justice is about retribution, payback, which is just most of the time, and fair most of the time. But that's not the only kind of justice that there is, and in fact, it's not the one that's talked about most in the Old Testament. The other type of justice is restorative justice, of paying back that which was taken. That's the kind of justice God seeks for this world. Restoration. Giving back. And so how do we love God? We help restore the world to what it's supposed to be. I'm not saying that there's no place for Retributive justice, there certainly is. But the kind of justice that's at the heart of the Old Testament law and at the the heart of God is all about restoration, about making things whole again. I think if we think about justice in those terms, the way we approach many situations may look quite different if our goal is to make things whole or as whole as they can be. So to seek justice to love mercy. It's an okay translation. Um, It it kind of misses the heart of the Hebrew word there, which is chesed. Yes, I know, it sounds like I just hocked a loogie all over Steve's camera. But this word means A better translation is loving kindness. There's that word again, love. And the kind of love talked about here and the kindness is about going out of your way to help others. This word is used to describe the widow who goes to give Elisha, I believe it was Elisha, the last of her flour and oil to make him some bread. And she used this loving kindness, this sacrificial love, giving the last of what she had to feed this prophet. And if you remember the story, she had plenty. More and more and more than she needed. This kind of sacrificial love, this kind of selfless giving, the going out of your way to help others, it pleases God pleases God. So notice already two of the ways in which we show our love for God has to do with how we interact with other people. But the third is the link. Walk humbly with God. I love the idea that though God is a spirit that the Old Testament often makes him human-like. They make him anthropomorphic to use the big fancy seminary word. 
like in Genesis, when God is in the cool of the day walking in the garden and he calls out for Adam and Eve, where are you? What's going on? This personal God. Do you walk humbly with God? Humility is the other side of that, realizing that we have the chance to come alongside, to learn and live with the creator of the universe. Are you kidding me? It is so wild. It is so incredibly wonderful. So our Micah passage shows us that the way in which we love God, some of the ways in which we love God and our neighbor, because they, again, two sides of the same coin, by seeking justice, restorative justice, to go out of our way to give of ourselves for others and to walk personally with God. Think about your own life. Are you seeking justice in this world? And I'm not just talking about in the big picture, in your relationships. Are you seeking retribution or are you seeking reconciliation and restoration? Which one is the way you define your relationships? Forget the big picture stuff, because if we can't make things right with those around us, how can we be the agents of change for this world that we're called to be? I don't think we can. What about loving kindness? Loving kindness. Do you go out of your way to help people when it's inconvenient, when you see an opportunity and you feel it, because I know we all feel it, that nudge from God saying, oh, go help that person, go do it. God, I got a five o'clock. It's 4.45. I don't, I don't have time to stop for this. Do you listen to the nudge? Do you allow yourself to be mildly inconvenienced in order to show God's love and kindness to someone? Or do we power through things? I remember a story in which, and I may have told it, it's okay, pastors do that from time to time. Not everybody will remember it. If I did, I was a youth pastor, and I'm, I was on my way to youth group. I'm not going to lie to you. I was cutting a little close to begin with. True confession. Confessing before a camera and Steve in the back, and now all of you. But on my way out, there was a bit of commotion across the street. There was a man lying in the middle of the street. When we approached him, along with uh, a couple other bystanders, we didn't know if he had been hit by a vehicle or what was going on. He, he appeared very out of it. And I had a decision to make. And I literally had the conversation in my head. You've probably had them too. The one voice going, there's other people here. What are you going to do? It's fine. Just go. He's, he's good. And he'll be fine. And then that other voice going, are you serious? So I stayed until medics arrived and they took him away. I, I, I believe he was under the influence of, of something. And I was late to youth group. I had texted one of the leaders, so she took care of things till I arrived. And I'm glad I did the right thing. It was okay to be inconvenienced. Those little moments of kindness really matter. And are you walking humbly with God? Are you spending time with him in his word, in prayer, in meditation? No, that is not an Eastern principle. Emptying your mind of everything and allowing God to speak to you is a very, very useful Christian practice. It takes me a while to dump everything out of my brain. But when I do and I hear that still small voice, it does a lot. And so this is again connected to our New Testament passage where, when we are told to love one another. It is the essential part of our Christian life. And if we don't do it, John warns us, you may not be as Christian as you call yourself. Harsh words, harsh words, but they're true. So how do we show our love? How do we love one another? 
I want to start with how we don't love one another. We don't love one another by just putting up with each other. That's the bare minimum. In fact, as Jesus said, even the pagans do that back in the day. It's not just putting up with people. It's not even just tolerating people. Love is harder than tolerance. Tolerance is a, is a minimum. Yes, society, we need to tolerate one another, but Christians are called to something even more than tolerating, putting up with, actively, sacrificially, selfishly, selflessly. Oh, that's a big, that's a big correction right there selflessly loving other people. How do we do it? By inconveniencing ourselves. By taking time. I was thinking about two big things that can help us be better agents of love. The first is to listen. We don't listen well to people. We don't listen well. So many times when I'm talking to somebody and I'm trying to to share how I feel, which for me, I have to really trust you to be able to do that because I have been burned too many times to count. And when I'm talking to somebody, sharing my heart, sharing how I feel about something, and I can just see the wheels in their mind are just turning and they're just trying to come up with what to say. Let us follow the advice of scripture and be quick to listen and slow to speak because when we listen when we take time to listen to people we actually hear the ways that we can love them that we can show kindness to them it's not up to you to figure it out just listen and part of listening is learning learning about our neighbors learning about one another learning about our experiences and our backgrounds, where we've been, what has brought us to this moment, what defines us. You can love much better if you learn. And when we listen and learn, it enables us to truly love our neighbor, to be able to put ourselves out there in uncomfortable situations. Unfortunately, this isn't a a recommendation It's not suggested that we love one another, that we love our neighbor. One of my favorite um, internet memes is a giant billboard that somebody actually put up and took a picture of. And it said this, that love thy neighbor stuff, yeah, I actually meant that, God. It's not optional. It's at the core of our faith. We love God by loving others, and we love others by loving God. So people of God, let us love one another. Let us seek opportunities to go after justice, to show loving kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. In doing these things, may we better be able to love our neighbor and to love one another Because to love is to know God, and to know God is to love. Let us pray. Almighty God, help us, equip us by your Spirit to be able to love one another and to love you with all that we have, even when it inconveniences us. For in this you are pleased, and you give us more and more power, authority, and energy to be agents of restoration and love in this broken world. Help us, we pray. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. Stay well.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you today filled with many things. First, we are filled with gratitude for who you are and what you have done. We are grateful for the wonderful warmth and brightness. We are grateful for the beauty of creation. We are grateful for the realities that in this area, infections and hospitalizations and deaths have all been steadily decreasing. And we pray that continues and we pray that for the rest of the world as well as we continue to deal with COVID-19. We have so much to be grateful for, Lord, and we don't adequately take the time to thank you for it. Thank you for our families and our homes that have been our fortresses for these past few months. We remember and pray for those who have not. We thank you for the overwhelming majority of our congregation that has remained healthy and well during all this. We pray for all those in our community that have not. We pray that we have maintained and enjoyed relative safety throughout all this time. We pray for those who have not. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for healing, for divides that have been present for far too long. Help us as your church to listen, to learn, and to love, to follow your example, to live out our calling. We pray for our leadership. This is a difficult time. We pray for every leader in every office throughout our country, from the highest office to the most local. And we pray that you would give them strength and courage and that you would work in our leaders, Lord, to make us one in you, healing that which has been broken, unifying that which has been divided. And Lord, help us, even in our own families, and our small circles, which as things open up, will start to increase bit by bit by bit, to speak out against injustice, to have hard conversations, to be quick to listen and slow to speak, to consider others' perspectives. Again, to listen, to learn, and to love. God, as we get close to being back together again at first, Give us all patience to deal with new realities. We're all learning how to do this as we go. Thank you for the leaders of this church who have diligently sought to seek the good of this flock and have lived up to their callings with the utmost integrity. Lord, we pray for your church the world over as we begin to get back together in the flesh though we've always been united in spirit through the prayer you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Before our benediction, just a quick announcement. I mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again. Weather permitting, we will be worshiping together outside next Sunday, June 21st. Uh, the guidelines will be sent to you digitally. Uh, you should have them by now digitally at the time uh, you see this. And for those of you that don't have access to email and are, are viewing this, you'll be receiving a hard copy via snail mail uh, in the not too distant future. It will provide uh, any, uh, uh, all of the guidelines that we're gonna implement to help us to worship safely. If you have any questions, please contact myself, a member of the consistory or the church office, and we'll let you know uh, what you need to know. And we are overjoyed, I am overjoyed uh, to see you all next week. Receive God's benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. Be well, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>